State property. Man, this has been one of my most requested videos as of recent. People have been telling me to do a video on them ever since my Rockefeller documentary, which you should definitely go check out. Link in the description. Recently, I did a video on the locks and people hit me up about doing a video on state property. I really like this group a lot because I believe every member could have been big in their own right. To me, Beanie Siegel is one of the most underrated rappers ever. I love Bean's music, don't get me wrong, but I feel like PD Crack had the highest ceiling if I'm just being honest with you. Like, call that a hot take as much as you want. Like, yo, as much as I like Beans, but PD definitely could have been that guy to me. I hated how they did PD on the Kanye documentary. Like, people on Twitter was wilding on PD. You know, people was calling him a bum. And this is why people need to be educated because PD was nice. And the hype that he had around him was for good reason. But the young guns were really good. And I don't think that a lot of people know that they're actually Grammy nominated. And that's within good reason as well. Chris and Neve was tough. I mean, go check out the song Full Effect off of Freeway's debut album, and you'll see why. Speaking of Freeway, he is highly underrated to me as well, and to me, he has probably one of the best solo albums on Rockefeller, at least before the breakup, and that's Philadelphia Freeway. Oskino and Sparks also had a lot of potential as well, and Oskino will have a big part towards the end of the video, which I don't want to get into right now. But before I get more into the video, I would first like to thank you for coming to see this because you guys can be doing a million other things right now, but instead, you're here with me, and I appreciate that. If you guys like the content, you guys should like, comment, and subscribe to help the channel grow. Also, follow my Instagram too. That would be greatly appreciated. Comment down below your favorite member, favorite song, favorite verse, lyric, etc. from State Property or from one of your favorite members. Also, let me know where you're tuning in from, represent where you're from, especially if you're from Philly. All right, without further ado, let's get into the video. Before we get into the history of State Property, I have to give a quick backstory behind each of the members. Let's start off with Beanie Siegel, and Beans grew up in South Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and actually got his rap name by combining his childhood nickname Beanie in the name of a South Philly street, which is Siegel Street. Beanie would meet a guy named Murder Mill, and he actually really made Beanie want to start writing because Murder got off on Beanie during a rap battle. This inspired Beanie to write more raps, and they ended up becoming partners. Mind you, before this, Beanie wasn't taking rap completely serious at the time because he still had a hand in the streets. Murder Mill and Beanie ended up battling a crew named Philly Most Wanted, which was comprised of Mr. Man and Bubonic. After the battle, Bubonic exchanged numbers with Beanie because he felt like he was nice with the rhymes. The duo would then persuade Beanie to join them at a meeting with the heads of Rockefeller. The crazy thing is that initially, Beanie didn't really want to take that trip to New York to Rockefeller because he was trying to bet on a dog fight that was, you know, it would have definitely won him a lot of money if he did win on his dog fight. Just imagine if Beanie did not go to that meeting. 
During this meeting, though, Dame Dash kind of sparked a confrontation between Philly and New York rappers that were present. Someone from Philly would rap and then someone from New York would, and Beanie was quiet throughout all of this, and it wasn't until someone made a comment about something involving cheesesteak and Philly to when Beanie started rapping. Dame actually thought that Beanie was from New York at the time, but Beanie checked him and said that he was from Philly. Dame went and got Kareem Biggs Burks, but Beanie wouldn't rap anymore. But he finally caved in and started to rap again, and people were going crazy. Jay-Z was in the studio at the time and was pissed that people were pulling him out of the studio because he doesn't write things down and was in the zone. Beanie was still hesitant to rap because it wasn't his meeting, but he did it again and basically he walked out the building with Jay-Z wanting to sign him to Rockefeller. His material was raw, straightforward, and vivid. You can feel everything that he said to a T. Not that long after this, Beanie ended up getting a deal. The next person is Freeway and he was born in West Philly but grew up in North Philly after the age of 12 or 13. This is actually the age that Freeway started rapping and he always felt like he was going to make it one day. Once Freeway saw people blow up like even Beanie that was from his hometown, he knew that he could make it. It's also self-explanatory on how he got the rap name Freeway because if you know, then you know. But he did go by a couple of names before he settled on Freeway. Freeway would be rapping on stage at a club and someone pointed out that Beanie was there. Some time went by and Beanie told Freeway that he wanted him on the team as soon as he got situated. Somewhere in this time period, Freeway along with a bunch of other rappers got taken to New York to rap for Jay-Z, which actually wasn't Freeway's first time rapping for Jay-Z because he did it backstage at the Tyson vs. Botha fight in Madison Square Garden in January of 1999. According to Freeway, when he rapped for Jay-Z, when he went with all of them rappers, Jay-Z ran out of the room and thought that Freeway was crazy. Freeway actually had a warrant out at the time for his arrest and was on the run, so he thought that he was about to get a record deal and get a lawyer. A week or so after this, Freeway was back on the block and some cops pulled up behind Freeway and his friend while Freeway was playing his demo for him. Freeway knew that he had warrants, so he got out of the car and ran and then the cops caught him and he would end up going to jail. Once he got home, he was put on house arrest for a while and Beanie was in California at the time and told Freeway how nice it was out there and how once Freeway got off of house arrest, he would be there right with him. Beanie stood true to his word and Freeway's big introduction was on the song 1900 Hustler where he had a crazy burst. He actually wasn't signed yet when he did that song because he still had to prove himself through various means but ended up getting a deal with Rockefeller Records as we know. The next people that I want to talk about is the Young Guns and I know Neve Buck specifically is from West Philly but migrated to North Philly and met young Chris in junior high. Chris wasn't rapping at the time and Neve inspired him to do music and he showed him the game. Neve ran into a man by the name of Stevie G who was managing Beanie Siegel at the time and also got Philly's Most Wanted a deal as well. According to Neef, when Beanie kicked the door down, there was a lot of rappers who wanted artists from Philly. I know people might mention Philly's Most Wanted, Ram Squad, etc., but that's what Neef said. But Stevie G brought the Young Guns up to New York and was shopping them around to different labels. They went to Rockefeller first, and according to Neef, this was about three weeks out from the Hard Knock Life tour, which the tour started in February of 1999. The Young Guns felt comfortable with Rockefeller and felt like they understood them and everything made sense. The Big Three at the time told the Young Guns to come back in five days with five songs and the Young Guns came back and did what they did and Dame Biggs and Jay couldn't believe it. Here's the thing though, because the Young Guns ended up dropping Stevie G because Stevie wanted to have the Big Three go through him, but Rockefeller wanted to just sign the Young Guns straight up. The Young Guns got into business with some other guys and they wanted them to go to Bad Boy. 
But the Young Guns knew that if they went with Puff, they wouldn't have much control over their image. But obviously, we all know that they ended up going with Rockefeller. Emilio, Sparks, and Oskino were rappers out of Philly who knew a guy who knew Jay-Z. Oskino was from North Philly, really like all over, like if I'm being honest, and Emilio is from West Philly. They rapped for this guy, and he went and took them to rap for Jay-Z. Jay went and got Lear Cohen and brought him upstairs, and the rest is history, and they got signed. But at least a little more backstory on Oskino, and he didn't know he was really going to be a rapper until 1997, 1998. Actually, in June of 1997, Oskino got shot nine times when he was 18. Crazy. To me, he has the craziest story out of any state property member, and his life needs a whole Hollywood movie about it. Yo, his life, crazy, crazy what happened to him. Crazy. Oskino does have a YouTube channel with plenty of videos talking about his story, so definitely go check that out because I was watching a couple of his videos for research, and yo, and like next thing I know, two hours have passed, and I was just engaged with his life stories. But Oskino was in the military, I think like I think I think the army, and he signed up for nine years and got through basic training. He went back to Philly, and that's when he got shot nine times, and now he couldn't go back to the military. Him and Sparks got signed in 1999, by the way, and Oskino just turned 21. Another fun fact is that Oskino actually rapped for Jay-Z a year before he got signed. He drove all the way from Philly to Boston to rap for him after a show. Oskino actually used to roll around with Jadakiss before he signed to Rockefeller. He went to the Rough Rider studio so much, they just started to just let him in. At this point in time, you had mad people trying to rhyme for Jadakiss. But in order to get to Jadakiss, you had to battle Oskino. And through this, some people walked up to Oskino and asked who he was signed with, and he said nobody. They said that they knew Jay-Z, but we can skip to when he rapped for Jay-Z, and it was him and Sparks. Jay-Z said that he wanted to take them in a different place, so he went and took them into a bathroom, and Oskino and Emilio are going back and forth rapping. Jay said that they sounded good together, and Oskino told Jay that he didn't want to go back to Philly if he was going to be like with Rockefeller because it was dangerous in Philly. I can't blame him, especially with his past, but Oskino asked to stay in like in like the hotel and Jay laughed at him because like Oskino thinks that he didn't understand that like Oskino could go back home and he could get shot and killed or do something himself. Now we can go to PD Crack and he grew up in North Philly. The funny thing is that PD Crack was never supposed to be his rap name. He was actually going by the name Pedro Tequila, and he happened to have a rhyme in a rap where he mentioned the name P.D. Crack was something along the lines of, they call me P.D. Cracko like Benny Blanco. Benny Blanco being a reference to Benny Blanco from the movie Carlito's Way. That was everybody's favorite rap, and they cut the O off of Cracko, and that's how he got P.D. Crack, even though P.D. has said that he never wanted to glorify Crack or anything like that. Growing up, PD dabbled in the street life and was very mischievous as a kid. Hip hop was always around PD growing up, and his uncle put him on to people like Public Enemy and LL Cool J. He hated school and didn't want to do nothing else besides write raps. Tough Crew from Philly really made PD realize that he could do rap because they were from Philly. PD actually went to high school with fellow state property member Freeway, and they were in a group called Ice City. They used to skip school and make tapes. PD was on a song called Chitty Bang Bang, which he says was a banger in the hood, and developed a local buzz. Freeway would actually get signed to Rockefeller before PD. PD at the time thought that it was BS. It was a double-edged sword because on one end, PD saw that he could actually get signed because someone very close to him did after years having a belief that he could make it but also was unsure. PD had previously met Oshkino and Sparks through their manager and Oshkino drew a liking to PD and asked for his number to do a song with him. PD and Oshkino ended up doing a song together. They ended up putting another rapper named Young Grant on the song who rolled with Beanie at the time, but Young Grant sadly got murdered. 
so they needed someone else to put on the song, so they got Emilio. After this, the song got taken up to Def Jam and Dame Dash ended up hearing the song. People were very impressed with the song and Petey was told to come down to Miami if he could come and Petey ended up meeting Dame Dash who asked him about signing that night. Beanie put in a good word for Petey too. Dame asked Petey if he had a lawyer, which Petey didn't, so Dame told him to get one. Petey took his number and for two weeks, nothing happened. But about a month after the Miami thing, Petey got a call from a lawyer and he ended up getting a deal. Petey got signed around 2001. As he said on the Flip the Script podcast, Petey got signed when he was on the run from the law. This will conclude the first part of the video. This second part is where I'll cover the start of State Property until the breakup of Rockefeller. Let's start with the release of Beanie Siegel's album, The Truth, which released in February of 2000. The album peaked at number 5 on the Billboard Hot 100 charts, selling 155,000 copies in its first week. With this album, Beanie let it be known that he was really the truth and on the rise. Philly was on fire, and as you heard in the beginning of the video, once Beanie hit, a bunch of labels were trying to sign artists from Philly, in which Rockefeller was one of them. After Beanie signed person by person, people who eventually ended up on state property got signed. We would see this talent from Philly appear on the Dynasty Rock La Familia album that was released later on in 2000 in October of that year. Initially, this album was meant to be a Rockefeller Records compilation, but after the records Guilty Until Proven Innocent and I Just Wanna Love You, Give It To Me were recorded, it was decided that it would be a Jay-Z album. Def Jam Records also didn't want to release it as a compilation because they felt like it would be hard to find in the record stores if it wasn't under Jay-Z's name. Beanie Siegel appeared on the songs Change the Game, You, Me, Him, and Her, Streets is Talking, This Can't Be Life, Stick to the Script, Parking Lot Pimpin', One Eye Hundred Hustler, The ROC, and Where Have You Been. Emilio appeared on the song I Just Wanna Love You, Give It To Me, and the story behind this is that it was an old song Emilio had before he even signed to Rockefeller. Oshkino was originally on that too, but he was in jail fighting a murder charge. According to Emilio, Beanie heard what he was doing and told Jay-Z, who came in and liked it as well because Jay-Z needed a single, and Emilio's original version of that song was on an entirely different beat from the one that we have today via the Neptunes. As I said earlier, Freeway would appear on 1900 Hustler, and according to this list of 23 things that you might not know about Jay Z's The Dynasty Rock La Familia album, it says that, and I quote, because Rockefeller had signed so many rappers from Philadelphia at that point with Oshkino, Sparks, Beanie Siegel, Young Chris, and Neef, Freeway wasn't officially signed to Rockefeller Records when the Dynasty hit stores. Puff Daddy tried to sign him once the album came out, but he eventually signed to Rockefeller. The list also says that Beanie Siegel was originally supposed to have a verse on 1900 Hustler, but instead let Freeway have his slot. Now we can skip to January of 2001, and on the morning of January 12th, 2001, Jay-Z called Funk Master Flex and told him to get the beats ready. Later on that day, Oshkino, who literally was fresh off of getting out of a murder charge, Freeway, Emilio, Beanie, Young Chris, and H Moneybags, who wouldn't be in what would eventually become state property, but like, you know, they would all be a part of history. Here's a clip of their takeover of Hot 97, and it's crazy. Everybody went in and slaughtered. Stripes were definitely earned that day. About cop and putting it out on the campus. I've been messing Team with policies, they put it in my pampers. I get it from dollars or I get it from the ransom. They gon' see me wild if they don't get that advance up. Get them hands up, the rockin' here. Whole seizure, yeah, they stop and stare. Clothes rockin' wear. Keep a roll with a lot to spare. Enough coke so the block and shit. Yeah. Call out of Call him. Guys, I told you he's 16. What's crazy is that Oshkino has said that beforehand, he knew Emilio because they were in a group together 
only saw Freeway a couple of times, and prior to that point, he had never met Beanie or Chris and Neef, but Chris was the only one out of the duo that was at Hot 97. These dudes obviously didn't all grow up and come up together, but another interesting thing that I found out about Hot 97 was that Oshkino also said that after Hot 97, they went on tour about 11 cities off of like a radio station cypher, which is nuts. They didn't even have an official like song out, but everywhere they went, people knew the words to their cyphers. Like It was just crazy. Neef actually said that before the Young Guns was even signed to Rockefeller, they shot the movie State Property, which we'll discuss like later on down the line. But in the year 2001, the members of what would become State Property would have a beef with Major Figures, who was like a buzzing rap crew out of Philly at the time. Now, for those who don't know who the Major Figures are, may know probably their most popular member today which is Gilly the Kid. Back during this time, Major Figures was buzzing like crazy. Their track, Yeah That's Us, from their debut album, Figures for Life, which released in 2000, reached number two on the Hot Rap Songs chart. I know that like the group was actually supposed to have a deal with Rockefeller, but that didn't go through. Basically, how Gilly explained it was originally Major Figures was supposed to sign to Rockefeller, but the deal wouldn't go through because of money concerns. Gilly said that they would have to sell like a stupid amount of records to make some money because they had seven members in the group. The members of Major Figures became impatient and started inking solo deals. When Major Figures passed on the deal, Rockefeller wanted to keep the money they received so they assembled state property and the rest is history. Just imagine if we had Major Figures on Rockefeller instead of state property. The alternate timeline would be crazy. There's actually people within state property that actually previous to 2001 had tracks with members of Major Figures. I know Freeway and Beanie had some for sure, but like that's just off the top of my head. Now, how the Major Figures state property beef started is kind of a debate. Some people think that Jay-Z took offense to Major Figures not taking the Rockefeller deal, and some people feel like Jay was taking shots at Major Figures on the song Do It Again, Put Your Hands Up, off of his album Volume 3, Life and Times of Sean Carter. Now, there's some back and forth about who Jay was necessarily talking about, whether it was people like the Major Figures or the Locks or whatever. But here's Spade from Major Figures discussing the origins of the beef from his perspective. I turn, I tune on the radio. All these guys on here rapping filthy, talking absolutely dirty about me. Now, when you say all these guys, man, who? Uh, let me run them all down. Petey Crack, Oskino. Uh, Sparks, Freeway, mm -hmm. uh, Lil Chris, Lil Neef, and Beans called in and endorsed it. Yeah, mm -hmm. young boys, that's how y'all do it. Yeah, young boys, yeah, young boys. But when I see Beans, he say he don't have nothing to do with it. And they even had the gall to put my son's name in the verse. You don't involve a man family. My son ain't never spit a bar in his life. You know what I'm saying? I did some research and I think this is the diss Spade was talking about from the Young Guns which really set things off according to Spade. If it's not the actual diss he was referring to then it's still from around this time period and Young Chris specifically was going at Spade pretty crazy. Not lazy James and Spade, you ain't heard the verse week. Why you rapping scrap, figure for life, then a dime the first week. You can hate all you want, I'ma still be Chris. Wordy, a lot of paper, filthy rich. Young East, the architect, Me. built these hits. Both yeah. the block, shoulder stock, filled with tips. Hollow, shoot through hollow, what? hit the hands, Barry. You mess around and get no Celine Barry. Stop hating Chris, yeah. the clip hole 80 prick. Go hop for baby. <laughs> As a result of this situation with the Young Guns going at Major Figures, the Major Figures came up to Power 99's The Come Up Show not that long after and sent their shots back. Here's a clip. 
of Ask the Club. Lil Chris, hey, hey what's, what's up? up? Lil Nut, I raised them up from bucks. This ain't a joke, we ain't laughing, laughing much. much. No, you dudes ain't even on my level. Ain't on I mean, level. you keep screaming a rock, you're just a bunch of fruity pebbles. Low ass herbs, I'ma get the last, last word. word. You choose to wipe the microphone or the mass bird. bird. Now, if I splatter his mask, uh -huh, what happened? The town will be happy and beans will be mad. He's crying. No. Jay will be happy and Dame will be glad. Why? They can have a tax write off. The niggas, niggas is, is trash. trash. And what about Oskino? What about Oskino? I mean, what, what about, about Oskino? He used to wear Moschino. <laughs> the jeans that was tight in the ass, I could see right through you. Your aura is glass. Well, ain't time to come to Gilly. You use your, you, you lose that gorilla mentality. Yeah, young boys, at me. Ain't time I'm around, I'm ain't time I'm around. You ain't no gorilla killer no more. I know you, dog. Don't come at us. Hey, yo, listen, I know you. Hey, listen, listen, girl, girl, girl. You was nobody before this rap game. Nobody, nobody knew you. No hoes mess with you. Yo, you was nothing. Yo, girl, listen. Don't play with me, hey. boy. I'm there's a lot going on involving this situation with different members of state property because besides being a group, they all were connected to the situation in different ways and some members of the group initially went harder than others. One of the other famous stories from the situation with the major figures was when Beanie Siegel ran into Gilly on South Street in Philly. Now this isn't the only run in a member of state property had with major figures or vice versa, but it definitely is one of the most well known. Now there's all sorts of wild things like regarding the events of what happened between Beanie and Gilly. Some say that Beanie put hands on him in front of Birdman and company, while some people said that that never happened. However, if this did happen, people say it took place during an NBA All-Star game in Philly. Well, if that's the case, this event would have occurred at the 2002 NBA All-Star game, which took place in February of 2002 in Philly. But back to the main point of why I brought up the situation with Gilly, and it is because the beef between major figures and state property went like beyond wax and people actually ended up going to jail as a result of it. If I was going to get into the intricacies of the state property and major figures beef, that would take a while because there's a lot of history and that can maybe be a whole other tale for a whole other day. Maybe. I'm not completely sure yet. But yeah, like that beef is, it's, it's a lot. It's really, really a lot. But away from the major figure situation and right before we move into 2002, we must mention Beanie Siegel's second album, The Reason, which released in June of 2001. That album would peak at number 5 on the Billboard 200, selling 151,000 copies in its first week. Young Chris would appear on the song Think It's a Game, and Emilio would appear on the song Tales of a Hustler, which Oskino has said was originally his and Emilio's. In January of 2002, the movie State Property was released. Something interesting that Oskino has said is that before the group was State Property, there was actually two names tossed around. One was Cocaine Cowboys and the other was State Property and obviously they went with State Property because it sounded better. Let me know in the comments about which one you prefer. The film made over two million at the box office and could be seen as successful depending on what the budget was because if it really was $600,000, then yes, the movie definitely is successful. This movie is also a hood classic film. Like, not saying that it's the best in any shape or form, but I definitely watch this movie a couple of times a year because it does have good replay value and is hilarious in some parts. You can easily watch the movie for free on apps like Pluto TV, so definitely give it a watch if you have it. But not that long after the movie was released, State Property's debut album was released as well. This sold 51,000 copies in its first week, making it number 14 on the Billboard 200. This album was led by the single Rock the Mic, which had Freeway and Beanie on the track with Just Blaze doing the beat. Just Blaze has said that Emilio Sparks was supposed to be on the original song, but got bumped off. Just Blaze continued by saying that Emilio was knocked off of a bunch of records. The song would end up peaking at number 55 on the Billboard Hot 100. Just Blaze made the beat in about five minutes. I know now that there's a Rock the Mic remix with Nelly, I think, but there was originally a Rock the Mic remix that never came out. It was a remix with everybody from State Property and Jay-Z. They all had eight bar verses and then Jay-Z dropped a 16 at the end. 
Just Blaze had completely forgotten about the existence of the song until he ran across it while he was shutting down Baseline Studios years later. But back to the album, and Nee Buck has said that the first day property album was supposed to set up Freeway. There are some standout tracks to me on this album with Rock the Mic, International Hustler, and Sun Don't Shine being a few of them. Later on in 2002, the classic movie Paid in Full was released. We all love this movie now, but I don't know if many people actually know that this film didn't do so hot at first and grew a following over time. The film only brought in about $3 million on a $7.5 million budget when it first came out. But with time, the popularity of this movie grew, and the soundtrack to this movie is another great one. It was a double disc, with the first disc containing classic songs like Before I Let Go by Frankie Beverly and Maze, The Bridge Is Over by Boogie Down Productions, and Paid In Full by Eric B and Rakim. The second disc was a collection of new songs recorded by Rockefeller at the time, and the standouts to me are I Am Dame Dash, Champions, One For Petey Crack, and Bout It Bout It Part 3. The soundtrack went on to peak at number 53 on the Billboard 200, and the reason why I bring up this soundtrack is for one song in particular, and that's the song One For Petey Crack. This is a story I have told on my channel about like three or four times already, but according to Petey, Cameron saw him perform the original version of One For Petey Crack in Philly, and not that long after that, Kim asked Petey if he wanted to do it over with him. Next time Petey went to New York, he laid a verse and then Cam and Jewels would put their verses on the song. At the time, this was Petey's first song with the real big artist because Cam was buzzing with him releasing Come Home With Me earlier in 2002. But Petey went on to go play the verse for Jay-Z and when it got to Cam's point in the song, Jay-Z told the engineer in the studio to delete it. Petey after this would tell Cam about the deleted verse and he told him not to worry about it and Cam gave Petey another copy of the song. Later on, Petey would play the song for Beanie Siegel because he was excited and Beanie would do the same thing but he would break the CD. What's hilarious about the situation is that you can easily listen to one of the original versions of One for Petey Crack on YouTube. You will not only hear Cam and Jewels' part, but Beanie actually has a verse on there too, which is just funny to me. But when asked why Beanie might have broke the CD, Petey said that he thinks that Beans did it out of loyalty for Jay-Z at the time and not really anything personal towards Cam. Now let me know in the comments if you think that Petey should have joined Dipset instead of State Property because that would have also been crazy in my opinion. But back to the situation and how Cam breaks it down is that at the time that the song was being like made, nobody was messing with Petey Crack but Cam did and actually wanted him on Dipset and wanted to sign him but Dame didn't want that to happen because of the whole Philly Harlem thing. Now there was some issues because Beanie and I'm assuming members of State Property had an issue with Cam getting on a quote unquote Philly record even though PD didn't even know that they wanted to get on the record. Dame comes to Cam and said they wanted to keep State Property on it and still have Cam but get rid of Jewels in which Cameron didn't like that. Now I understand that I wasn't like there during these events and I never act like I was but in my opinion there was definitely some tension going on between the camps and we'll find out later like we'll find that out later on in the video. 2002 would also be the year that State Property Wear was released. Benny Siegel was asked about this at the time and he said that the clothing line would be the hottest urban brand since Levi's and described it as quote unquote hard everyday wear. Let me know in the comments if you used to rock State Property clothing or even rock a wear back in the day. One of the last things I want to cover about 2002 is that State Property were involved in two different wars. They were going at Nas and the Locks. They were going at Nas because of Jay Z, and Nas were at like war at this point, and we pretty much all know, which originally started between Memphis Bleak and Nas. There was some tension between Jadakiss and Jay Z, which initially resulted in a D block and State Property slash Jadakiss and Beanie Siegel beef. It was on and popping at this time, and State Property had to ride with Jay by default, and then went to war with him. They were really holding their own, and State Property was going crazy, man. Go look up their freestyles and things of that nature, whether they're on Hot 97, Rap City, some mixtape stuff, etc. 
they was not playing at all. Everybody was a spitter in the group. The last thing regarding 2002 that I want to discuss is the whole Cameron vice president thing. Let me play a clip explaining what I mean. When they first got there, it was a little, it was a, it was a little tricky. Rockefeller gave the diplomats a label, and we gave state property a label. But Cam was moving a little quicker than Beans. I told Beans, Beans, I'm gonna make you a vice president. Cam, I'm gonna make you a vice president. But the way a boss does, Cam went to the radio, quick, just when we were discussing it, and told the whole world. We hadn't even negotiated it. So now, everybody on the label, I'm talking about everybody is like, what, I gotta ask him for videos now? They was Dame friends, so I guess the tension between Jay and Dame came. They was trying to give Cam a vice president position or something like that. And Vito was out of town, so when Vito flew in, he was like, whoa, what's going on? We was cool, like, they probably a dipset got along. We was all coming from the same place, so it wasn't no tension between us. We always were bosses. Now we on Rockefeller. We like, what do you do? It was like, nah, Dame like a big brother. We going crazy in this shit. You can't tell us no. Who gonna tell us no? We went dumb in Rockefeller. There seemed to be friction in the camp. You knew something, something was going on, but you didn't know the, you know, the severity of it. You didn't know how bad it was. This is why I don't necessarily believe that things were all sunshine between people like Beanie and Cam, because Cam even told a story on Drink Champs about Dame saying that he wanted Cam as vice president and wanted to bring Beanie along when he got it together and learned more about the business. Kim went on Rap City and talked about it and repeated what Dame told him. Time passes and Kim walks in the studio where there's Beanie, Jay, and Memphis Bleak. Kim said that he got that feeling when he walked into something and you know somebody was just talking about you. Beanie pulled Cam aside and talked about how he felt that Cam made him look bad on TV because of Cam's comments about him, even though Cam said that he was just repeating what Dame Dash said. Cam saw what was going on and realized the situation. Cam said that they might have felt a certain way also because Cameron and them had an office and were making various other moves, etc. By the way, Cam has explained the office thing and said that when he came to Rockefeller, they had two big walk-in closets with cubicles in front of them and he had people clear them out and turn them into offices. Artists on the label were upset by this because you gotta remember, Cam at this point had been on Rockefeller probably less than a year and artists were probably like, how is he already getting a potential VP position and how is he getting like an office along with other things? Not knowing that at least with the office thing, Cameron made the offices because no one was actively using the space. He had people put in a phone line, hired interns and did a bunch of other stuff. Some people felt like Cam was moving too fast and this would cause some tension, especially with Jay-Z, because he wasn't in the loop of some of these things, especially with the VP thing. At the top of 2003, we got the first solo album out of a member from State Property that wasn't Beanie and that man was Freeway. As I said earlier, according to Neef, the first State Property album was supposed to set up Freeway and it did. Freeway would release Philadelphia Freeway in February of 2003 as it peaked at number 5 on the Billboard 200 charts. Everybody but Oskino had a verse on this from State Property and this album has some heaters man. Definitely one of the best albums top to bottom from the prime Rockefeller days. What we do was the first single from the album and Just Blaze was the producer for the track. He did an interview with Complex and he said that at this point things at the label started to get into a bit of a disarray. He said that it was one of those things where the single didn't really get worked and the video didn't get a lot of play even though it was a huge record on the streets and in the clubs. Just Blaze also said that Jay came to check on Freeway in the beginning of the album and at the end of the album for a total of two visits. The first time Jay came to hear the album, Freeway played him what we do and Jay said that he wanted to get on it, which in tune Beanie said that he wanted to get on it too. But the last single for the album would be Flipside, which Just Blaze is also the producer of. Just Blaze said that Oskino was originally on Flipside, but was yanked off. Man, I would kill to hear the, like Oskino's verse on that song. Man, like what a shame. It was originally Freeway doing two verses and then Oskino on the last verse. 
Flipside was also originally a derivative of the song Rock the Mic. Jay-Z wanted Beyonce to do an R&B version of Rock the Mic, so Just Blaze flipped the beat and did an R&B version of it. At the end, Jay-Z was going to get on it, so Just Blaze changed the beat up a little for Jay-Z to rhyme to. Beyonce never finished the song, so Freeway got his hands on the switch up part that Jay Z was going to rhyme on, and the original name for the song was called Make the Cake. Just Blaze went back and tweaked it some more because it still sounded too much like Rock the Mic. Flipside was supposed to be the first single, but it didn't exist in its current form until after they decided to shoot the video for the second single on the album called All Right. It existed as Make the Cake at the time, but right before they shot the video for All Right, Just Blaze made Flipside from Make the Cake. Petey Crack would be added to the song, and speaking of Petey Crack, he would actually get locked up in 2003. I'm pretty sure this might have been on the Rock Army tour, because this was around that time, but like I said earlier, while on Rockefeller, Petey had been on the run. Petey was in a deep sleep in the hotel room when he was supposed to check out, and the cops busted down his door to see if he was alright, and they would end up finding out Petey was on the run and arrested him. Petey didn't get out until about 7 months after this, and the State Property Chain Gang album was already out. The Chain Gang Volume 2 album would release in August of 2003 with it peaking at number 6 on the Billboard 200, selling 69,000 copies in its first week. Some highlights from this album are Temporary Relief, Can't Stop Won't Stop, BB Gun, and Rolling Down the Freeway. Can't Stop Won't Stop by the Young Guns would end up being the biggest song from this album. They had to put that song on the album to when Neef's words carry weight. That song ended up being nominated for a Grammy, and that song actually went on to peak at number 14 on the Billboard Hot 100. Petey has also said that songs like G-A-M-E and Temporary Relief was meant for his solo album, but when he got locked up, he gave them away. This year, we would also see Beanie Siegel get locked up on a murder charge. Unfortunately though, 2003 would be pretty much the beginning of the end for Rockefeller. There was starting to be an obvious split with the heads of Rockefeller at this point, and Jay was supposed to quote unquote retire with the Black Album, which released in November of 2003. 2003 would end up being the calm before the big storm, because in 2004, Rockefeller would officially split. In 2004, Jay-Z, Dame Dash, and Biggs sold their remaining 50% stake of Rockefeller Records to his parent label, Island Def Jam. Jay-Z was also named President and CEO of Def Jam Records. At this point in time, I feel like everybody kind of knows like what kind of happened with the breakup, but if you want to know more, I would suggest you watch my whole Rockefeller series, especially the third and fourth episode where I break it down. Basically, the roster of people that were signed to Rockefeller had to make a choice. Do you want to go with Damon Biggs or go with Jay-Z? I saw an interview with Emilio on DJ Vlad, and he said that it wasn't like that, and that literally, they ripped a piece of a paper in half, and one sheet went to Jay and the other went to Dame. But anyways, despite this, from my knowledge, Beanie, Kano, and Dipset, and some others sided with Dame. The Young Guns, Bleak, Kanye, and Freeway, along with some others, went with Jay. Dame would start his new label, initially calling it Rock for Life, before changing it to Damon Dash Music Group. It was said to still be an imprint under Universal, but not under the control of Dev Jam, which Jay-Z was president of. To ask the reason why this was, it was probably done because Dame probably didn't want to have to report to Jay-Z. Dame Dash's deal would soon fall apart after allegedly constantly pissing off label executives because he was trying to get a bigger role in Universal to get to the same level as Jay-Z because like I said he was a president of Dev Jam at the time. This split pretty much like everybody on the roster affected everyone especially state property and the individuals within state property. According to Emilio around the time of state property 2 is when he noticed things started to split. He said that when they stopped using Baseline Studios to record their music that's when he knew because Baseline was very significant to Rockefeller for those who don't know. In another interview Emilio said that when Death of a Dynasty came out that was another big sign. Also, there was some tension in state property because people wanted to get on point with the business side of things, so they went to Beanie and he didn't really give them any answers. Like I said earlier, according to Emilio, he said Damon J and them had a sheet and split the artist. Whether you believe this is up to you, but I find it too convenient that Jay ended up with Bleak if that's the case, and Kanye for the matter, but that's my personal opinion. 
but Emilio's contract was almost up, so he wasn't really worried because he ended up going independent. Now with Freeway, he ended up with Jay-Z, and there really isn't much to say on his part for the split. It took him a couple of weeks to fully process it, and the reality didn't set in until after he dropped his 2007 sophomore album, which is Free At Last. Now Petey has a hilarious story about what happened to him with the split. After the split, Petey was considered a free agent, and Dame wanted to have a meeting with Petey. Petey would then go to the meeting and notice some things were off. He noticed that normally when he was around Dame and his people, they would usually take shots of Armandale vodka, but today they were drinking out of the bottle and telling him to drink a bottle and kept on doing toast. Petey got drunk and then Dame pulled out the paperwork and Petey said that he would only sign to Dame for the right price. Petey said a number and then Dame offered him ten dollars to $15,000 according to Petey. I'm sorry Dame, but that's just, that's just, yo, that's, that's wild. This is super duper wild. But Petey said that they used to make that at certain shows. Dame would then call Beans to talk to Petey, but Petey told Beans that he wasn't getting enough bread from Dame, so Beanie told Petey to take his Rockefeller chain off and give it to Dame because Petey was wearing Beanie's Rockefeller chain at the time. Petey would thank Dame and Biggs and walk out, but someone would come out and say Dame added another 5000 on like whatever he promised or proposed to him, and Petey just ignored it. But by chance, Petey's lawyer would run into Jay-Z after this, and they talked, and they set up a meeting for Jay to talk to Petey. At the meeting, Jay said that him and Dame had a meeting about where the artists were going to go, and Dame sounded like he really wanted Petey, so Jay let him do it, which like also furthers why I don't think that like the whole paper thing happened. Petey ended up going with Jay and kept the same contract that he previously had. After the Rockefeller split, Oshkino sided with Dame Dash, and the reason for this is because in an interview, Oshkino said that you can't call Jay-Z and ask for $10,000 because you don't even know his phone number. He said that Dame Dash did right by him because when Oshkino got shot and he needed an appointment out in New Jersey, Dame got it done and also paid $3,600 a month for Oshkino's rent. Dame even came to his trial, but we're not done with Oskino quite yet. Now the Young Guns stayed with Jay, and just like everyone else, the split definitely affected them, but like Freeway, there isn't much to say right now with them about the split until I talk about what happened to them and what they actually exactly did after their split. Now the last person I wanted to talk about is Beanie. Beanie had so many legal issues at this time, man, like crazy. He had that attempted murder charge in, from 2003 and ended up pleading guilty to a federal gun charge that ended up like with him getting a year and a day. Beanie ended up being acquitted of the attempted murder charge in 2005 and this was the year that he ended up being released. While he was locked up, his album The Becoming would release in March of 2005 peaking at number 3 on the Billboard 200, if my memory serves me correct, everybody but Neef Buck was on the album, and also this album was finished previous to Beanie going to jail. The movie State Property 2 was released the next month in April of 2005, and when Beanie got out of jail in August of 2005, one of the things Dame Dash handed him was a copy of State Property 2 because Beanie never saw it at this point, obviously because he was in jail. Beanie was interviewed upon his release and he said that he still loved the Young Guns, Petey Crack, and Freeway like brothers, but at the time, he didn't know if he would ever record music with them again. Here's what Beanie had to say. Do I think they were disloyal for going with Jay-Z? Nah. My whole thing is they were disloyal to me, period. Just not being there, period, for me. Not for the business decisions they made. I was mad because they weren't loyal to me, period. Even when I was on house arrest, before I got booked, I didn't get a phone call. I never got one letter from any of them since I've been in jail. Oskino and Sparks are the only ones that kept in contact with me. Then Beanie was asked about why he sided with Dame instead of going with Jay, and he said, it's no choice. I didn't make no choice. When people see I'm with Dame and Biggs, I'm with them together on off days. It ain't just business with us. I'm chilling with them. I've never been around Jay on an off day. It ain't like I made a choice of running with Damon Biggs or Damon Biggs held me down through my whole trial. It's not like that. I would be a sucker if I signed 
with Damon Dash Music Group because they did that for me. You see how we chilling now. This ain't about no business. Where's their property at? They knew I was supposed to get out today. It's real. Not to say Jay ain't never did nothing for me. I got love for Jay, like I do Damon Biggs. But even if I was to sign with Rockefeller, I would still be here. There was a lot of drama with Beanie getting locked up because earlier that year when Beanie was locked up, Dame Dash and Beanie Siegel's mother announced Beanie Siegel's prison mandate to put state property on hold until he was released from jail. Here's what Oskino said. Can't no one man put nobody on hold. State property was a movie. Then they branded us. They got a clothing line of sneakers, but it wasn't no contract where we was a group named State Property. We were all in individual groups. The Young Guns was a group. Me and O was a group. Pity Crack was a solo artist. Beans was a solo artist. Freeway was a solo artist. Jay-Z signed me and O. People say Beans got everybody signed. That ain't true. Neve Buck would chime in and say that it wasn't really no state property because Rockefeller put everybody together. He said nobody really knew each other. Everybody was rapping and trying to get on. He said that people made it hard for them in so many ways because people said that they had to come out with Beanie. Bean's mom said that the group was supposed to join Beanie and Dame, but the members thought otherwise. Beanie was also hurt, like he said, that he hadn't like heard from state property while he was in jail, minus a few people. Neve said that him and Beanie never really had a crazy relationship like everyone else does. Petey said that when he was in jail, nobody wrote him because he didn't want anybody to write him. The only person who came and saw him was Freeway. Oshkino tried to see him but couldn't and he talked to Beanie on the phone. Petey said that that's not how they roll when a person is locked up because dudes don't want to see dudes when you're in jail. All you're worried about is your girl, your mom, your grandmother, and your kids. You're not worried about no dudes in jail riding you back and forth. Oskino would also chime in and say, what are we supposed to do? Be stagnated? I got kids. I gotta make moves. I probably ain't take the time out to write him. My fault. But he could have reached out to me. I got the same number. You got money on the books. You can call. My home address never changed. I'm still in the same neighborhood, but I got real busy. It's time to focus on me, cause Beans ain't around to handle business. What do they mean we on hold? I'm supposed to tell my son or daughter we can't eat because Beans is locked up. They all at this time still concluded that they had love for Beanie and all agreed that there was no beef among them. But literally a month later in September, there was a song that appeared on Sheik Lucha's album After Taxes called Kiss Your Butt Goodbye Remix and Beanie was going at the members of State Property. Beanie said that he was throwing the rock down and he birthed, fed, and burped State Property. Basically saying that those were his kids and he would put an end to them clothe them, wipe the snot from their nose, and he didn't want to expose them. So clearly things weren't on the surface all sunshine and rainbows, and Oskino I know has directly responded to this. This is a video with him and a young Meek Mills, and he's talked about like the record and how it's not true. Now this part of the video I swear is so messy, not because I'm like exposing things, because I'm not, but messy in terms of there are so many inter beefs and interwoven storylines of state property throughout the years after the breakup of Rockefeller. For instance, with Oskino alone, he has had something to say about Neef, Beanie, Jay Z, and Emilio. I think Oskino took the breakup a lot differently than a lot of people outside of Beans because Oskino was also super loyal to Jay Z and Oskino has said some like wild stuff. Starting with Jay, he would say that Jay-Z was the one who sent state property at Nas during their beef, and the phrase Jay would always say according to Eskino was act like they killed your cousin. Like, <laughs> I'm sorry. That, <laughs> crazy. Crazy. Oskino also said that Jay-Z used to steal raps and said that Jay would always have everybody rap their bars to him and if he didn't have any bars off hand, it was a problem. He said that Jay-Z remembered every single word, which is just like crazy in itself, especially if you know how Jay doesn't write down lyrics when he records. There also has been allegations of Jay biting people. We all know Cam, Nas, and other people accused him of taking rhymes from Biggie, but I've seen people accuse him of taking rhymes or even the style of Young Chris, especially, and really running with the whole like Philly flow and everything. 
I think that that's the Blueprint 2 era, which would make a lot of sense because according to Wayno, Jay-Z pulled young Chris in around this time because Chris was going through a rough time due to his friend passing, I believe, and Jay really took him under his wing and he had him with him like every day and like they were doing like a lot of music together. If you're from Philly, let me know what you think of that whole situation. But was Jay-Z out here throwing y'all flow like that? Let me know. But back to the Nas thing, you know, Skino felt like Jay owed them for like that whole thing because Jay-Z was like in big danger. Like he was big danger in his career. Oskino said that due to them going so hard at people like Nas, it affected their careers. And because of this, Jay should pay them. There's a little bit more to this. I don't really want to get into all that. But to relate it back to state property, Oshkino had issues with Beanie because he alleged that Beanie was stealing money from them all the way back in 2003. Oshkino talks about how after their first Hot 97 tour, they were all getting per diems, which is like a daily allowance. Oshkino and them had never been on a tour to that point, so they didn't know like, like that was like a thing. And four years later, he found out about the situation and that he was getting paid every show. There's like a lot of other things too, especially with like involving Beanie and Oshkino has plenty of videos where like it's whether it's on his channel or he's being interviewed and he talks about it. Go look up that type of stuff if you want to learn more. But now onto Oshkino and Neef. According to Oshkino, when he was in jail, Neef Buck gave him money. So when Oshkino came home, he thought that like that was his bro. When Oshkino came home, he started like to rap again and was wondering how he could get on the iTunes since music was going digital. Neef told Oshkino that it was $3,500 to get on the iTunes, but he said that if Oshkino gave him $1,800 at the moment, that he could like give him the rest later. Oshkino found out later that obviously getting on iTunes wasn't this pricey, so that was strike number one. Oskino found out it was like $60 to get on the iTunes. Then it came the situation of when Oskino saw Neef dancing in the video with Beanie after the diss, even though it was Oskino who got his money back when Beanie allegedly stole the money before Oskino went to jail. Oskino explained this by saying that he was in Atlantic City and he finds out State Property is having the show, but nobody knew about it. He told people within the group about the show and also called the promoter about how was he having a State Property show, but nobody within like State Property knew about it. The promoter said that he gave the money to Beanie, so the promoter paid again and Oskino went back to Philly to give the crew their money and now they were going like against him with beans, so that was just crazy. Oskino in 2017 said that he could forgive Neef, but he doesn't really mess with people that be telling. Now, this is a whole other can of worms that I also don't feel like opening for time purposes. People talk about if Neef snitched, I don't know, man. Wild situation, but I'm not trying to get into all that. But now we have Oskino and Emilio, and as we know, they signed as a group. While Oskino was locked up, it was Emilio handling the business, whether it was doing movies, singles, like and or like keeping like the name alive. Emilio said that Oskino going to jail was losing them a lot of money. Now Oskino has responded to this and said that he only went to jail because he was trying to get his money right, you know, through various means. I'll talk a little more about Oskino at the end, but man, there was just so many problems, like crazy. But now let's get into the last part of the video, where I'm doing a where are they now and the status of the state property reunion. A little before the big split, the Young Guns would release their debut album, Tough Love, in February of 2004. This album peaked at number three on the Billboard 200, selling 128,000 copies in its first week. They would be competing for the top spot with label mate Kanye West because the college dropout was released a few weeks earlier. We all know how Kanye would eventually rise up and be the star of The Rock and take the place of many people who people looked like over him for. The Young Guns' next album, post the Rockefeller split, was Brothers from Another, and this was released in May of 2005. This album wouldn't do as hot as the first one, with it peaking at number 15 on the Billboard Hot 100. After this, 
the members of the Young Guns would release solo music throughout the years and would last release a mixtape together in 2010 called Back to Business. They had some mixtapes prior to that, but I believe, but the duo would then embark on solo careers and release their own projects. In 2013, Young Chris did an interview with Complex and he was asked about Neef and he said that they were like always going to be together. Young Guns is tatted on his arm and they moved their families five minutes from each other. That's his brother, not biologically, but he cares for him and nobody can come in between that. Now, I said earlier about the Rockefeller split that PD was considered a free agent and ended up going with Jay-Z and kept the same contract that he had before the split and worked on his debut album that never got to see the light of day on Rockefeller. He would appear on Neo song Stay under the name PD PD because obviously PD Crack isn't like the most marketable name like out there. And I, I even heard a thing that like a company like Corona were like interested in having him as a sponsor, but having crack attached to your name isn't the best. When it comes to PD's album that never came out on Rockefeller, he breaks it down as when he was ready, then the label wasn't ready. And when they were ready, he wasn't. In 2008, PD was released from his contract and he made a couple diss tracks toward Jay-Z, but now in retrospect, PD does appreciate the shot that Jay-Z gave him. PD has still released music throughout the years though. Freeway would drop his second studio album, Free At Last, in November of 2007, where his album peaked at number 42 on the Billboard Hot 100, selling about 36,000 copies during its first week. It was first reported Jay-Z was stepped down as president of Dev Jam in December of 2007, and shortly after this, Freeway announced his release from Dev Jam. Freeway, throughout the years, would still continue releasing projects, and he would eventually end up reconnecting with Beanie Siegel. As of recent, Freeway has been having a bunch of problems with his health, but I think that that has been getting better as time goes by, and he's actually gotten back with Jay-Z under Rock Nation as well. Beanie, after the split, was originally with Dame Dash and Dev Jam, who he released his third studio album, The Beat Coming With, in March of 2005. The album was completed before Beanie served time in 2004. After this, Beanie ended up back with Rockefeller Records while still on Dev Jam, where he would release his fourth studio album, The Solution, in December of 2007. After this, Beanie would release a few more projects after his contracts with Rockefeller Records and Dev Jam Records had expired. I know at one point of time, Beanie was supposed to sign a deal with G-Unit after he got out of prison, but Jay-Z refused to release him from Dev Jam in 2005. According to Beanie, 50 Cent wanted to give him a whole label deal and a whole lot of money, but Jay refused to release him. Jay would say that he would see what he can do, but that see what he could do would turn into another two years for Beanie. So much stuff happened to Beans throughout the years, going to jail for various reasons, getting shot, and speaking of getting shot, he got shot in 2014 and was left in critical condition. He ended up losing a lung and this significantly affected his voice and as a fan, it's still hard to get around it. I've already covered a good chunk of Oskino, but he's went through a lot in his life and after the split, he's been very vocal about his dealings with Rockefeller and various members of state property. In regards to why he never put out an album on Rockefeller, Oskino really blames himself for that. Throughout the years, he's put out music found an interest in painting, started a YouTube channel, and has done many other things. Emilio would go independent after the Rockefeller split. Down the line, he would also start a clothing line. He would also continue with acting, and a lot of people really mess with his acting, especially on State Property 2. He was definitely one of the highlights in the movies. But back to State Property as a whole, and in 2008, MTV did an article about State Property and how most of the crew, besides Oskino and Neve Buck, were eating lunch before like a late night performance at a restaurant. Despite Oskino and Neve not being there, it's said that the group insisted that they were still down despite their absence. This interview came out in September of 2008, and the group said that they were working together, making music for the past several months at this point, but had finally decided to come up to the surface and speak about it. Here's what Beanie Siegel had to say. The plan right now was to make sure the State Property Project gets finished up. 
Find a home for that and make sure everybody's individual projects be set up properly so we can move forward from there. The State Poverty album will be good to put things back in perspective and showcase us as artists. At the same time, we got Chris working on a solo project that's long overdue. Petey's working on his solo project, Sparks, Freeway, Me. We want to make sure we line up our ducks in order so when the State Poverty thing pops off and pops off the way we expect it to, Everybody can come right behind it and not miss a beat. We've been sprinkling songs out there and letting people know the best is yet to come, but we're not missing a beat. There was rumors in 2009 about the whole state property making a deal to go to Rock Nation, but that never happened. Previous to this, they had music come out on mixtapes, but throughout the years, State Property have done shows. I know in 2011, there was a reunion concert in Atlantic City, New Jersey, where every single member of State Property showed up. Hopefully this wasn't the concert Oshkino was talking about earlier with the stolen money thing because he said that it was in Atlantic City. But anyways, at this time in 2011, in addition to new music, Beanie also said that he was working on a movie script for State Property 3. Now speaking of State Property 3, it has been rumored for a while. In 2015, around the 10th anniversary of State Property 2, Dame said that he wanted to do a State Property 3 and that it was his main priority. Well, this never happened and we have yet to get State Property 3. But we've seen State Property come out and do concerts throughout the years, but Oskino hasn't been a part of all of them. They went on the Now or Never tour in 2018, which I know, and they also did a concert in 2019 where they brought out Lil C's and Jadakiss. I will say that as of recent, Oskino and Beanie seem to have settled their issues because Beanie made an appearance on Oskino's YouTube channel and it's a great watch. Beanie has also seemed to be on better terms with Jay-Z, so that's cool too. Buzz surrounded State Property again after the Dipset and Locks Versus with the announcement of the Rap Superheroes Tour. People was also interested in potential matchups for State Property for a Versus. Me personally, I would love to see State Property do a Versus so they can get their flowers and I love Dipset, but State Property versus the Locks would have made more sense in my opinion with their history or even State Property versus Dipset, like if you're talking about like the time that both crews came in. Comment down below who you would like to see State Property go against if they do a versus. All in all, this will pretty much complete the video. I broke down the backstory of each individual member, the history of the group, the breakup of Rockefeller, what people are doing now, and some of the latest events surrounding the group as a whole. Some people want another State Property album and or movie, which would be cool, but man, I just want them to get their flowers and show people that like they were and are the truth. Their two albums from Rockefeller alone are crazy, and like we're not even going to get about some of the features each of the members have done. Shout out to State Property, all of Philly, and everybody rocking with me in this video. Sorry it took almost a year, but like we're here now. Let me know what you guys thought of the video in the comment section below. I love you guys with all my heart. Peace.